but Jackson is making plans in Tennessee. Jackson conceives of a brand new political party. He withdraws to Tennessee and he's going to make a new political party, a party that is true to the ideals of Thomas Jefferson. God rest his soul. He's up there with General Washington in heaven. To honor the recently passed Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson starts to call this new organization the Democratic Party. And here he, he begins to build allies from across the United States. Jackson decides he's not going to be cheated of the president, presidency a second time. And the entire goal of the Democratic Party is two things. One, to undermine the presidency of John Quincy Adams. And two, to prepare for the 1828 election. And here is the first generation of the Democratic Party. This is the same Democratic Party we have today, founded by Andrew Jackson. We have his old army buddy from the days of the War of 1812, Sam Houston. His young protege uh, from uh, the state government of Tennessee, James K. Polk. They bring in this really intelligent dandy from Eastern Pennsylvania, tied into the Pennsylvania political systems, James Buchanan. But uh, Jackson's two most important allies are over there on the lower left-hand corner. He brings in Martin Van Buren, who is tied in to the political machines of New York and New York City. And he brings in John C. Calhoun, this half-crazed senator from South Carolina who can deliver the Southern vote. And together, all of these guys begin to build an entire new political organization and an entire new political system and a new way to campaign for presidency. And the 1828 campaign begins. And it is unlike anything the United States has ever seen before. There are parties. There are these massive rallies involving thousands of people, pamphlets, dozens of new newspapers. No one has seen, ever seen anything like the Jackson campaign before. People will go, they'll, they'll see these pamphlets saying, you know, Jackson forever, the man of the people, come on Saturday and meet the man who is going to be the next president. And people are like, ooh, we get to meet the person who's going to be the next president. Thousands of people would show up. Jackson would have vast, would have huge barbecue pits set up. He's feeding all these people. He's got huge tubs of whiskey punch set up, piles of beer. It begins with a pastor who gives a benediction and then gives a huge sermon. And then there's an opening speaker who whips everybody up about how evil and awful John Quincy Adams is, how John Quincy Adams has betrayed the legacy of, of beloved, recently departed Thomas Jefferson, who would have never agreed to a second bank of the United States. Jefferson would have never agreed to any of this. And John Quincy Adams stole the election in the corrupt bargain from the man you're about to meet, Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson would come out, and the people have been well-fed. The whiskey punch is doing its business, and 5,000 people would just go absolutely berserk over Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson wouldn't have any of that gentlemanly, I, you know, none of this sort of, oh, he is me, he is merely my friend, he is not my enemy, he is merely my opponent. That sort of stuff that Thomas Jefferson did, Jackson doesn't do any of that. Jackson would go up to the stage and say, I'm here to talk about John Quincy Adams, that lying, skeeving son of a bitch who stole the presidency. And the crowd would just go nuts. They just loved it. They just loved it. And then they wouldn't just bring people in. Jackson would say, I don't even need, he's like, not only do I need your vote to restore democracy to the United States, I need your money. Contribute. And people would throw money into plates and they would, the Democratic Party would gather this money and start all these newspapers. They started something like 40 new newspapers all over the country. And the point of each of these newspapers was not to make money. It was to just continually print and give away awesome news about Andrew Jackson. And poor John Quincy Adams, he doesn't even know what hit him. They are completely unprepared for this. John Quincy Adams, you know, is more at home, 
you know, in a university lecture hall, you know, talking about edgy art and culture, you know, he, the idea of standing in front of 5,000 screaming half drunken people and calling your opponent a son of a bitch. That is not John Quincy Adams's style. Uh, he, he tries to throw a little shade on Andrew Jackson. He calls him, starts calling him Andrew Jackass. Uh, and you can see from the political cartoon in the upper left, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's sort of creepy. It's a, it's a donkey with the head of Andrew Jackson. Uh, but Jackson just turns this around. Jackson just completely turns it around and make, and owns it. He's like, my opponent has called me a jackass. And he's like, I am a jackass, a donkey, humble, tough, stubborn, gets a day's work, gets a day's worth of food for a day's work of pay. And John Quincy Adams has called all of you people donkeys too. And the crowd would just go nuts. All right. Uh, and that's how the donkey became the symbol of the Democratic Party. It's still the symbol of the Democratic Party today, 21st century. Uh, poor John Quincy Adams. He's just like, he's just like a grass hut in a tornado. He doesn't even know what hit him. It is not even a close election. The only person that can find a weak spot on Andrew Jackson is Henry Clay. Henry Clay finds the, eventually finds Andrew Jackson's weak spot. Andrew Jackson's weak spot is his mother and his wife, Rachel Jackson. Andrew Jackson grew up in the backwoods of the Carolinas, and he wasn't, he didn't really know his mother real well, and his mother was, was kind of moved around the, through the backwoods. And he married um, Rachel Jackson. But it turns out that Rachel Jackson, there's some weirdness with her personal life. She was married to a guy who abused her, and she left him and was divorcing him when she met young Andrew Jackson. And they hit it off. They had this whirlwind romance, and Andrew Jackson marries her. And then they find out that um, they had married, and the, the paperwork for the divorce had never been finalized. Uh, so they actually had to go back, and she had to re-divorce her first husband while she's married to her second. And anyway... Andrew Jackson is really, really sensitive about this. He's really sensitive about anybody criticizing his wife, Rachel Jackson. I mean, he killed a man in Tennessee already, shot him in the eye. Um, so, <laughs> right in the eye. So Henry Clay starts this whisper campaign about Andrew Jackson's mother. He says, Andrew Jackson, raised by one whore and married another. Rachel Jackson's social life is ruined, ruined. She's, she was never a very physically strong person. She, everyone kind of laughs because, you know, behind her back, she's, you know, married to two men. And uh, Andrew Jackson wins the election by a landslide. And he is beyond outraged at what Henry, at the whispers that Henry Clay has been spreading about his wife. And his wife, delicate Rachel Jackson, right before her husband takes the oath of office as president, she dies of a massive heart attack. For the rest of his life, Andrew Jackson will refer to Henry Clay as the man who murdered my wife. Mm. And he appoints Martin Van Buren, Secretary of State. And he takes all these raucous crowds he tells all these people that elected him president, come to my inauguration and we'll throw a party the likes of which has never been seen before. And Jackson is absolutely correct on this. He basically holds one of these colossal rallies in the White House. 20,000 people show up and they proceed to have the most famous or infamous party in American history. 20,000 drunken people storm the White House. <laughs> they, they tear down chandeliers. They tear down paintings. They break cutlery. They put up a bonfire in, the, in front of the White House. They rip, out, they rip out the bathtubs to put them in the front lawn to fill them with whiskey punch. 
<laughs> this, it's this it's this terrible event. Um, and the people are, are, you know, Andrew Jackson takes the oath of office and they as, as all these people rampage, <laughs> dancing and playing cards and toasting Andrew Jackson. Uh, Andrew Jackson has to escape through a window and and the city officials of, of Washington offer him the they, they're like, should we call out the army? There's 20,000 people tearing the White House down. And Andrew Jackson's like, no, that's the people's house and they can do with it whatever they want. And they proceed to party for almost a day and a half tearing the White House to shreds. They wreck it. Uh, and this was a, this is a, a, a eyewitness account on the left that shows the greatest or the most infamous party in American history. Washington had never seen anything like Andrew Jackson's inauguration and never have ever since. And this is what one uh, socialite in uh, Washington said. Uh, but what a scene we witnessed. The majesty of the people had disappeared and a rabble, a mob of boys, Negroes, women, children, scrambling, fighting, romping. What a pity, what a pity. No arrangements had been made and no police officers placed on duty and the whole house had been inundated by the rabble mob. We came too late. Ladies fainted, men were seen with bloody noses. Such a scene of confusion took place as is impossible to describe. <sighs> if, if ever I had access to a time machine, that's, that's, the, that's what I would go see. I would have to see that with my own eyes. Drunken dudes fighting in the White House. Oh my God. Uh, and it's like weeks. It's weeks before Andrew Jackson could actually move it. They have to replace almost everything that's in the White House. <laughs> the tubs of tubs of whiskey. <laughs> Good Lord. Anyway, uh, John Quincy Adams, just utterly humiliated by his loss, goes back to Boston, goes back to New York. Uh, and he, he later comes out as a congressman. But for the most part, uh, his national career is over. The only person capable of putting together any kind of resistance to Andrew Jackson is Henry Clay. Henry Clay becomes is now a senator from Kentucky, uh, and he gathers together what's left of the old Democratic Republicans, fragments of the old Federalists. Just don't call them Federalists, because those guys were like traitors and cowards and stuff. And the emergent professional classes from the cities, like doctors and lawyers and dentists and stuff. And while it isn't given an official name until 1833, it becomes known as the Whig Party. And Henry Clay becomes the leader of the Whig Party. And the Whig Party is dedicated to three things. One, opposing every single thing Andrew Jackson tries. Two, to implementing the American system. And three, getting Henry Clay elected president. This is the dawn of the second party system. The second party system consists of Andrew Jackson's Democrats versus Henry Clay's Whigs. And there's Andrew Jackson, there's Martin Van Buren, there's James K. Polk, there's Henry Clay, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor. And this is how Jackson saw himself fighting the Whigs as a hero, as Hercules, fighting the many-headed hydra of corruption and anti-Americanism. And that figure in the middle of the, of the monster hydra, that's Henry Clay, whom Jackson always refers to as the man who killed my wife. So this is, this is how the two, this is how the second party system shakes down. Um, you've got this kind of arrangement. The National Army. The Democrats are still opposed to the National Army. Um, sort of. This begins to change towards the end of Andrew Jackson's career, Andrew Jackson's presidency. Because what happens is that all of the young men who attended those rallies, who helped rampage through the White House, all of those young men begin to idolize Andrew Jackson. And in particular, they idolize his military career. So while Andrew Jackson's generation is not really into a national army, 
It's the people that come after him that begin to think of military service as glorious, military service as the perfect way to serve your country. So the Democrats are, uh, this generation of Democrats are opposed to the National Army, but the next generation of Democrats are not. The Whigs, oh yeah, the Whigs are all about the National Army. And now there is a National Army, and almost all of the main generals in that army are very loyal to the Whig party. What's their view of government? For the Democrats, they still believe in a weak government. But put a little asterisk next to that, because we're going to attach some notes to that. But the Whigs, no, the Whigs are into strong government. They, they like strong governments. That's the way to implement the American system. The Bank of the United States, the Democrats, hell no. Hell no. Andrew Jackson wants to kill the second bank of the United States. In fact, he saying he makes this very famous quote, either I will kill the bank or the bank will kill me. But the Whigs are all about the second bank of the United States. They are vehemently in favor of the bank because it is through the bank that they're going to create the American system. Slavery, yes, the Democrats are all in favor of slavery. They are very committed to the institution. They're not as committed as they will be, but... The Compromise of 1820 left kind of a foul taste in everybody's mouth, and the Southerners become increasingly reactionary, increasingly violent towards anybody that even questions the concepts of slavery and racism. The Whigs, ah, uh, the Whigs are yes and no about slavery. The Whigs have no official position on slavery. They just sort of leave it to the individual members. And basically the way it breaks down for the Whigs is that the Northern Whigs are kind of opposed to slavery, but they don't really want to do anything about it. The Southern Whigs are in favor of slavery, but they're not really going to strongly defend it. I mean, Henry Clay is a slave owner. I mean, he doesn't own a lot of slaves, but he owns some. Territorial expansion. The Democrats, yes, absolutely. The you know acquisition of Florida, a good thing. The Louisiana Purchase, a good thing. The Democrats are fully committed to enlarging the territory of the United States, especially if it means more land that can be placed under cultivation, which means more cotton, which means more money, but it also means more slavery. The Whigs are not into expanding the United States. They're like, absolutely not. This is a terrible idea. Uh, we should focus on the land we already have. Instead of making more land, we should make the land we have actually better. That's the entire point of the American system. Internal works, roads, bridges, canals, that kind of stuff. Democrats, no. Uh, to, to Andrew Jackson, if Kentucky wants a big freeway running through the middle of it, then Kentucky can pay for a big freeway running through the middle of it. It's not the job of the federal government. Weak government. The Whigs, no. The Whigs are absolutely committed to the internal works, improving the internal works. In fact, that's the entire American system is nothing but revolutionizing the United States through the construction of roads and bridges and canals and all that good stuff. Now, there is some regional stuff. The Democrats are basically in the South and in the West. And by the West, I mean things like Kentucky, Missouri, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana. Uh, and bizarrely enough, New England. New England is a solid democratic state, largely because of Martin Van Buren. Uh, the Whigs are mostly concentrated in New England and the Midwest, Michigan, Ohio. Uh, the, and as much as we have these two ideologies up above me, one of the things that characterize the second party system is these really oversized personalities, these like great men of their time. Andrew Jackson becomes the face of the Democratic Party. Henry Clay becomes the face of the Whig Party. The Democrats are generally committed to farmers and the working poor. The Whigs are committed to business and industry. And then there's John C. Calhoun. Uh, that, he's the guy in the middle. And, and I gotta say, I gotta say, it's, it's really, really hard to find a picture of John C. Calhoun where he doesn't look like a freaking lunatic. That's the, that's the friendliest picture I could find of John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun bounces back and forth over the, throughout the second party system. John C. Calhoun will bounce back and forth between the Whigs and the Democrats because John C. Calhoun doesn't really care about the parties. John C. Calhoun only cares about two things, slavery and South Carolina. He is 100% in favor of slavery. 
He is a dyed-in-the-wool racist, uh, and he becomes uh, Andrew Jackson's vice president. So John C. Calhoun orbits this entire time. Now, the bank wars. Um, Andrew Jackson is absolutely 100% committed to killing the Bank of the United States. He views the bank as responsible for the Panic of 1819. He views it as being hopelessly corrupt. Uh, it paid off politicians. In fact, Andrew Jackson discovers that the Second Bank of the United States has been paying large sums of money to Henry Clay. And Andrew Jackson is like, why are you paying Henry Clay? He's one of the most powerful men in the United States. And the man who killed my wife. And the Second Bank of the United States says, well, he's a lawyer and he does legal work for us. He did not actually do legal work. And Andrew Jackson is like, this is outrageous. This is totally corrupt. You are paying a politician money who has power over your institution. It's like, this is outrageous. And the Second Bank of the United States just sort of shrugs. So to, to Jackson, the Second Bank of the United States is, is responsible for the Panic of, 18, of, of 1819. It's hopelessly corrupt. It paid off politicians. It favored the rich and the powerful over the common man. Because when the Panic of 1819 hit, the Bank of the United States didn't bail out the little bitty farmer who had 50 acres. It bailed out the great rich planter who had 500 acres. Jackson says the Second Bank of the United States is fundamentally un-American. But to Henry Clay, the Second Bank of the United States is necessary, this, even though it's, they are paying him. Uh, the bank was necessary to stabilize the currency. It's necessary to calm the economy down. And the Second Bank of the United States is absolutely necessary to build Henry Clay's American system. And it all comes down to the year 1832. Now, in 1832, uh, the Bank of the United States uh, has a number of years left on its charter before its charter comes up. So Henry Clay makes a gamble. He says, look, 1832 is an election year, and the Bank of the United States is, is popular in Pennsylvania and New York. These are states that Andrew Jackson needs to win if he wants to be reelected. So the Second Bank of the United States is going to ask to have its charter renewed just before the election of 1832. Andrew Jackson, because he wants to be reelected, would never dare veto the bank just before an election. That's Henry Clay's gamble. Henry Clay gambled wrong. Jackson does not care. He vetoes the bank. And then he spends the next four years pulling the deposits of the United States out of the dying bank. And by 1836, the second bank of the United States is dead. Andrew Jackson has won the bank war. And then Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson wants to find land. Remember, one of, the, one of the platforms of the Democratic Party is territorial expansion. And he needs to find land for his supporters. Well, the problem is that there is land in the South, land possessed by several huge Indian nations. Andrew Jackson says, well, what are we going to do with these Indian nations? We're just going to get rid of them. They're going to move them. They don't think Andrew Jackson is serious. Andrew Jackson is dead serious. Andrew Jackson signs the Indian Removal Act of 1830, forcing the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, and the Cherokee out of their traditional ancestral homelands and forcing them to march along a trail of tears to their new homes in Oklahoma. It is a blatantly inhumane and cruel action. The Whig Party in the North is just absolutely shocked that Andrew Jackson actually does this, that he forces thousands of Indians to relocate, many of whom die along the way. It is one of the blackest marks in American history, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And to make things even more bitter, the Cherokee... The Cherokee fought with the United States in the War of 1812. The Cherokee army was present with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Jackson didn't care. You have to go. And the Cherokee decide to fight in court, and they take it all the way to the Supreme Court, and they win. The Supreme Court says that the Cherokee have an ancestral right to their land. 
but it doesn't matter. Andrew Jackson refuses to protect them. He says, either move to Oklahoma or be butchered by the Georgia militia. The Cherokee move. And that's why you find the Cherokee today at the end of that Trail of Tears in eastern Oklahoma. But the, the Indian Removal Act causes a major break between Andrew Jackson and one of his favored protégés, his old war buddy from the War of 1812, Sam Houston. Sam Houston had grown up among the Cherokee. Sam Houston had escaped an alcoholic family by running into the woods, and he was basically raised by the Cherokee. Sam Houston spoke Cherokee. Sam Houston married a little Cherokee girl. And Sam Houston can't believe that his hero, Andrew Jackson, is destroying the people he loves, the Cherokee. And there is a major break between Andrew Jackson and Sam Houston. And Jackson throws Sam Houston out of the White House. Uh, Sam, Sam Houston is leaving the White House absolutely furious. Everyone is very glad to see him go because they're like, you know, why is he sticking up for, you know, a bunch of savages? And Sam Houston is just apoplectic. And one of the members of Jackson's administration, one of the guys in charge of the Indian Removal Act, just outside of the White House, has, the very, has a very bad idea to make a crack about the Cherokee. He makes this like, I forget exactly what he says. It, it is a racially insensitive comment about the Cherokee while Sam Houston is being thrown out of the White House. And Sam Houston drags the guy onto the porch of the White House and half beats the man to death in front of the White House. And he's, he's about to be arrested. And Sam Houston uh, runs away. He, he takes off for the West. Uh, Sam Houston tells the police they can find him. GTT, gone to Texas. Henry Clay badly misjudged the election of 1832. Uh, and uh, Henry Clay runs as a presidential candidate. And uh, the result, you can just, well, you can see the results right there. They're not pretty. Andrew Jackson just shellacks uh, Henry Clay. The people of Pennsylvania and New York do not really care uh, that Andrew Jackson killed the bank. And for the second time, Henry Clay fails to win the presidency. And this leads into the nullification crisis. Now, the nullification crisis... Uh, I, it's, okay, where do we start with the nullification crisis? Uh, the, the, the place to really start is, is something called the Eaton Affair, but I don't really want to get into the Eaton Affair. The Eaton Affair is huge, and it's complicated, and it's really weird. Uh, in, in the most succinct way possible, the Eaton Affair was kind of this, uh, oh, the Petticoat Affair, was kind of this weird sex scandal where the Secretary of War for Andrew Jackson may or may not have married a prostitute while she may or may not have been married to a ship's captain who may or may not have killed himself. And uh, he was then shunned by all the women of Washington, including the wife of John C. Calhoun. And I, I don't want to go into the Eaton Affair, but I will say what happens is, is the Eaton Affair causes a major breach of trust between Andrew Jackson and Samuel uh, and uh, John C. Calhoun. And um, these two guys have a major falling out. And essentially in 1832, uh, Jackson essentially fires him as vice president and John C. Calhoun storms off. Uh, no, no, it's not in 1832. It's in, it's in 1830 where he fires him as vice president and John C. Calhoun storms off. And there's actually two years of Jackson's presidency where there is no vice president. And John C. Calhoun conceives of an old idea of actually of Thomas Jefferson's called nullification, in which uh, Calhoun argues the individual states can declare that a certain law is unconstitutional and then they don't actually have to follow it. And he thinks he's got Andrew Jackson in a bind because Andrew Jackson is supposed to be for a weak central government Therefore, if South Carolina opposes high tariffs, then he's got to force Andrew Jackson to either recant on his Jeffersonian ideas 
or let me get away with it. Uh, and John C. Calhoun badly, badly underestimates uh, Andrew Jackson on this. Jackson says, do not nullify the tariff. We're paying off. I'm in, I'm, I'm in the last stages of the bank war and I'm paying off the federal debt. Don't do it. You are challenging my authority as president. And John C. Calhoun does it anyway. And there you see uh, the political cartoon from the day. There's the union and uh, a donkey, the democratic state of South Carolina, which is trying to pull away from the union through nullification. And Calhoun dares him. Now Calhoun nullifies the tariffs and says, if you oppose South Carolina, you are violating your Jeffersonian ideas of a weak central government. And if you oppose me strongly, then South Carolina will secede and become its own country. And Jackson replies, if you separate South Carolina from the United States, I will separate your head from your body. Um, and John C. Calhoun dares him to do it. They nullify the bill. In response, Andrew Jackson passes the force bill. And there it is on the left. And the force bill basically gives Andrew Jackson command of the federal army. And he starts to gather the army together to march on South Carolina. The state of Tennessee offers him, offers Andrew Jackson the old Tennessee militia, the same army he won the Battle of New Orleans with 20 years ago. And Samuel, uh, John C. Calhoun is, is completely flabbergasted. He can't believe, can't believe Jackson is doing this. It's a complete betrayal of Jefferson's ideas. Jefferson was afraid that a federal army would be used against an individual state. And there is Andrew Jackson threatening to use the federal army against an individual state. Jefferson argued that the federal government should be weak and subservient to the state government. There's Andrew Jackson claiming, no, the federal government is supreme. So it raises this question that I would urge you to write down. Is Andrew Jackson betraying the ideals of Thomas Jefferson or is he defending them? But it doesn't matter. No other state will support John C. Calhoun. And at the 11th hour, Calhoun blinks and South Carolina agrees to negotiate. Primarily because they're just terrified of Andrew Jackson, who is basically openly calling Calhoun a coward and a traitor. Like, see, I told you we'd call a lot of people cowards and traitors. And South Carolina backs down from nullification. Andrew Jackson puts the army away. They negotiate and a much more balanced tariff is negotiated not a complete elimination of these taxes, but a much lower taxes is agreed. Besides, Andrew Jackson then completes one of the great accomplishments of his presidency. Andrew Jackson is the only president in American history to pay off the entire federal debt. All that debt accumulated by Alexander Hamilton back in 1790 is paid off by Andrew Jackson. He is the only president to have no debt owed by the federal government. But things are not all peachy keen. Uh, one of the things that happens is Andrew Jackson in 1835 becomes the first president that someone tries to kill. There is this really unbalanced fellow called uh, Richard Lawrence. And just outside of the White House, uh, Andrew Jackson is leaving the White House. Richard Lawrence steps out takes out a pistol, points it directly at Andrew Jackson and pulls the trigger. The pistol misfires and Andrew Jackson just looks at him completely stunned. Richard Lawrence throws down the first pistol, draws a second pistol, points it at Andrew Jackson, pulls the trigger, and that pistol also misfires. It is at this point where something snaps in Andrew Jackson's brain and Andrew Jackson picks up his hickory cane tackles 
this man who is one-third his age and proceeds to beat the ever-living snot out of him with his hickory cane. By the time police and soldiers arrive, they show up not to protect the president, but to prevent the president from killing Richard Lawrence on the steps of the White House. Jackson is 68 years old. 68 years old. Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson uh, then is no longer president. He decides, well, two terms were good enough for everyone else. Andrew Jackson is very old at this point in time. He declares his farewell address and he wishes, kisses the presidency goodbye. And as his parting shot, this is the above quote that Andrew Jackson says as he leaves the White House. After eight years of, as president, I have only two regrets, that I have not shot Henry Clay or hanged John C. Calhoun. And that brings us to the end of Andrew Jackson's presidency. And we'll pick up at the end of the second party system in the next lecture. And I will see you there.